Have you ever had alarm fatigue? I had alarm fatigue this morning when the alarm <laughs> clock went off. I have alarm fatigue every morning. <laughs> I have alarm fatigue every morning. But well, you could have alarm fatigue in an airplane as well. And I've got Deanna here to help me out with that. Deanna, welcome to the Malibu Guru Podcast and the KC Aviation YouTube channel. Oh, well, thanks. Well, we got to say that now because we're we're branching out more and more and more into the YouTube world. And uh, really, we're trying to do a good job with... I hate to know. break it to you. The YouTube has more subscribers than your podcast does now. That's pretty amazing. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's amazing to me to how far we're reaching out in so many areas. And it's what we want to do. We want to get our message of safety and uh, safety and operating these airplanes in a professional manner. We want to get that message out. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and here's a good subject for today, alarm fatigue. And basically it's a, you know, it's the same thing. I'm glad we talked about the alarm going off in the morning because when the alarm goes off in the morning for me, I generally lean over there, hit the alarm and get out of bed. Right. And, <laughs> and I do not. I hit the snooze button and I wait on it to go off a second time. But what gets me is my teenage son we can hear his alarm from across the house going off for 15 minutes straight in the morning with no response, you know, until you or I get up and go beat on his door or turn his alarm off. Yeah. That is what I think of when I think of alarm fatigue, that when is... you can simply tune that sound out like a teenage boy who hasn't had enough sleep. <laughs> teenage... <laughs> Teenage boys can tune a lot out, <laughs> including an alarm. Uh, it's amazing. But alarm can fatigue. It can happen in an airplane. And, uh, I mean, the, the most classic, classic example I can think of is in a Meridian M600 or M700. And the idea behind it is that one of the best place I can think of is that you pull the, po the power lever back to a point because there's two things that bring on the, the uh, gear warning system in a Meridian. And that is the power lever position if it's pulled back. And flaps. 20. And flaps, yeah. You go to 20 degrees of flaps and you're going to get a gear warning, which you can in a Meridian hit the button that says gear warning mute. Well, only in the event of the power lever being retarded. If you have 20 degrees of flaps, it will not mute that warning. That's right. But how many times in flight in a Meridian are you up at altitude and it's time to descend? Of course, every turbine burns, more, burns less fuel up high. And so a, a turbine pilot, just by nature, just by training, just by because he's going to stay as high as they can, as long as they can, because they go faster and burn less fuel up high. So the goal, so if they have, if every, they have everything they want, they're going to get an unrestricted climb all the way up to altitude and an unrestricted descent all the way down to the runway, which means you're going to spend as much time as you possibly can at high altitude, which means that when it comes, if you get that and then it's time to descend, you're pulling the power way back. And when you pull the power way back, what are you going to do? You're going to reach over there and hit the gear warning mute. And the gear warning mute can be dangerous, can't it? It absolutely can be. Yeah, so the, the goal behind it or the, the thought behind it is you can, you can mute the gear warning in a meridian and turn, so that you don't have the alarm telling you, that that the gears not the gears not down, but you're in a position to land, meaning the power lever's back. If you look at a jet prop, uh, jet prop doesn't have this. Right, you can't do it. But so what jet prop pilots tend to do, they cheat the system, which I do too. They push their power lever just slightly forward just, until it stops. That's right. And if they get to their mechanic, they'll tell them make that as in the range of where it's supposed to activate, but as far back as you can possibly have. I've seen some jet props that literally you go all the way back to idle and just barely crack it. And that's where the gear warning will stop. So they can cheat the system. Basically you can position the power lever in a place where you're not reminded about the gear going down. So this is an important thing. So there's a couple of rules in a Meridian that I, I tend to, to say, and that is below 2,000 feet AGL-ish, you know, which you're in the practice area, do not push that button. Right. Do, not, do not mute. If you're in the traffic pattern, do not mute. If you're making an approach, do not mute. I'd rather hear the bell go off and you actually get the gear to go down. I've even seen people that will pull the power back, get the gear warning, 
and put the gear down and mute the warning, in, in, meaning that they've, they put it down. I would rather hear it's not that. It is annoying, but if you know it's coming, it's not that annoying to hear that for a little while. Right. But the problem is, after you've listened to it for a little while, it's no longer something you're actively listening to. It's now become background noise that is is blending in with the other airplane noises in that scenario. So there is a point where you have it going for too long and you're no longer actively processing what that alarm is telling you. That's exactly right. And so there can be what we call alarm fatigue. That's the idea that you have an alarm going off in the airplane and you have the ability to either mute it or ignore it. Either one of those is can be a bad scenario. So you, and with the Meridian M500, um, M600, M700, you have this ability to, to mute the gear. It's a classic example. I can think of another one with a jet prop. Uh, jet prop, if you get low in the header tank, then you're going to get a, a header tank low light that is red, immediately followed by a yellow light that says wing pumps on it that tells you that the wing pump is pumping fuel into the header tank. So you get a red yellow light that comes on and the red comes on that goes off. And then the yellow comes on and eventually goes off once the header tank is full. It's a beautiful system. I love it. But you know what ends up happening is that people get so used to red and yellow lights going off on the panel that they think every light must, it must be that fuel light that's coming off. Right. Especially the ones that resolve themselves and go away. Um, you know, when I think of it, it's not exactly an alarm, but I think about on the, in the glass cockpits, the message light that flashes and you're positive. Oh, it's just telling me to switch fuel tanks or it's just warning me of airspace ahead, or it's just, you know, before you push it, what it's going to be, or you think, you know, you push it and then just out of habit, you push it again to clear it. And then you realize it was giving you whole new information that now you've missed. Right. I'll give you another good one. But before we leave that, let's go back to the jet prop one. It's interesting that I've had some, some uh, spouses fly with their husbands and, um, or with their spouse, I guess you could say. And they will be very in tune with the red and the yellow lights that come on. And so much so that when somebody moves from a piston to a, to a jet prop, and now they have these red and yellow lights going off all the time, the, the spouse tends to become not as aware of red and lights that are going off from the back seat. In other words, they're flying along. And it used to be when you're flying a piston, you get a red or a yellow light. It's like, what is that thing up there? Right. And, you know, and now it's happening so often that you just get used to it and you just, you tend to ignore it. So even the spouses ignore it. Sure. Um, pro pilots even in, and not the PA 46 series, but the King airs, you have a master caution and a master warning right at eye level on, the, well, right at my eye level <laughs> on the, uh, on the glare shield below yours. But in daylight conditions, sometimes these can be a little difficult to see in the daylight with some slightly dimmer bulbs, maybe, and so, but you get used to, you know, your gear goes down, you automatically start getting a, a master caution because maybe your props aren't full forward. So there's different scenarios in which these things just flash and, you know, you reach up and you just press the master without looking at the root calls, at the, enunciate, at the enunciations that are telling you what actually just happened. And you push the button, you don't even look down there and it could be something real. Let me give you another one that happens uh, that I see a lot is having your Garmin Navigator, your your 750 mm -hmm. is, the, is the idea, and you have it set up to send you messages, basically. And so the message light will blink, but it blinks every time you enter a new airspace. It blinks at you for your fuel switching. It blinks at you. For, I mean, it's like if you fly around complicated airspace, you're literally getting a message all the time. Oh, sure. You're constantly just constantly there. over there pushing that stupid message thing that keeps popping up. But every now and then something pops up that's for real. Like I'll give you one. The other. I feel like I just said this exact scenario. Is this one of those alarm fatigues where you've tuned me out as well? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to give you, a, I was going to give you a better one. I was going to give you a better one. When you get the message, the last time I had the message, cause you wrote the article about the, 
sunspots causing the wasps to go out. But one of the messages was it had downgraded the approach. Right. And I missed the whole stinking thing. Does that make sense? Right. No, would you... It's just, you know what I would do if I had a, the, the messages coming up on my Garmin Navigator is figure out what's causing that. Like, in other words, if it's your fuel message, but you have it every 15 minutes, change it to every 30. Right. Right. If you don't actually change your fuel every 15 minutes, you don't need the alert every 15 minutes. Correct. And uh, if you're flying IFR routinely all the time, you don't need to know if you're in your Class B airspace. With turn every that new off. level. Absolutely. Turn that off. Mm-hmm. Make, you know, in other words, refine what alarms are coming on so that you don't get alarm fatigue. So you have some control. But as a pilot, we really need to be careful that we don't let alarm fatigue reach up and bite us. Right. And, you know, I uh, going back to the landing gear, I remember I was conducting a training once uh, in a Meridian, actually, um, and... The, uh, we were doing a simulated engine failure. We were spiraling down towards the field. He was at 20 degrees of flaps. The gear had not yet come down, so he was not able to mute it. But having been in that configuration for a while, he just tuned out that alarm. So it's still going off. We're getting closer and closer to the runway. I'm just watching to see how low we're going to go. And unfortunately, Tower spoiled my surprise by <laughs> telling him his gear was not down, at which point he panics, adds power. We go around and I just remember, you know, it wasn't a, uh, oh, man, how would I let that happen? He turned and he looked at me and he says, please don't tell Joe. <laughs> 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 uh, um. But but it's same case, the the longer you listen to something or the more times you get the alarm or message or warning and it doesn't have any actionable item attached to it the more more likely you are to ignore that and also ignore when it is something important you know i've got one other area that uh that i'd like to say about this is that i've, I've seen a migration of pilots or a, 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 a shifting a drifting maybe drift is the right word a drifting of pilots to landing with lesser and lesser and lesser flaps so much so that I see pilots land all routinely with 10 degrees of flaps. Don't do that. Don't do that. If you're in a PA-46, land with a minimum of 20. I think you ought to land with 36 every single time. I've not met a crosswind that didn't do just fine in 36 degrees of flaps. And I I believe this mentality comes from, um, from those who believe have come from different aircraft that maybe didn't do as well with full flaps in crosswind situations or high winds, and they believe they need that lesser flap setting, carry a little extra speed, a little bit less flaps to compensate, and you just don't need that in the PA-46. Yeah, I think think Piper was real smart in their labeling of the flaps on the M600, M700. It literally says, takeoff flaps, landing flaps. And the idea behind it is, can you land on takeoff flaps? The answer is yes. But it says landing flaps, and we never have a problem with people saying, Oh, I don't like landing in landing flaps. Right. But they be I have people in the M5 and in the uh Malibu Mirage, all the piston versions, jet props, you know, where you have 36 degrees of flaps saying, Oh, well, I like 20, I like 60, I or I mean I like 36, I like 10. Well, and if nothing else, and you're right, never less than 20. And the reason is you know, there's an there's an old saying that I don't necessarily agree with, um, that there are those uh, who have landed gear up and those who will. And while that's not entirely true, it speaks to the mentality that it could happen to anybody. And the way, you know, that extra precaution, that 20 degrees of flaps gear warning that cannot be silenced. I mean, man, that's there to prevent that very thing. And it can absolutely happen if um, it, let's, you're if you're running a checklist, it, you get interrupted, you're going through your normal flows. You know, you always put the gear down at glide slope intercept. Well, right at glide slope intercept, you get a traffic call or an alert or something else flashes. You don't do it right then, but in your head, you did it right then. Next thing you know, you're down close to the runway and you still don't have gear. That's right. 
That's exactly right. Alarm fatigue. It can occur. If you're a person that's flying a PA-46 or a King Air or a TBM with the potential for alarm fatigue, think about that. Think about the times where you're not listening to what you could be listening to and how that could negatively impact your flying. You might have some ability to either think about why that alarm comes on or you might be able to influence when that alarm comes on. And uh, alarm fatigue, it can happen. Joe Casey and? Yana Casey. Signing out.